polar bears. They are amongst the most iconic animals in the world. Images of polar bears have appeared almost everywhere, through time from historical prints and paintings to books, magazines, films and TV. Polar bears have even been used to sell all kinds of products. This is polar cola made in Dundee in the 1960s. In recent decades, they've come to symbolise the environmental crisis. But the relationship between humans and polar bears goes back much further than this. Polar bears may live exclusively in Arctic environments, but their cultural impact extends far and wide. To learn more about the pervasive presence of polar bears in Western culture, you sometimes have to go to some unexpected places. Like Perth in Scotland. I'm Sam Shaw and I'm an art historian, so I'm primarily interested in representations of polar bears in paintings and prints. However, to get to the bottom of what really makes this animal so popular, I'm going to be talking to a range of experts in other fields as well. One of the first animals I filmed up north was the polar bear. I spent around about four or five hundred days in their company. In the 19th century, images of the animals that were native to the Arctic became a really highly emotive subject matter. As well as being important scientific specimens, they are part of our social history. To unravel the intriguing image evolution of the polar bear, I'm going to focus on a particular period around the turn of the 20th century, when several objects and images related to polar bears entered Scottish collections. So I'm going to start by looking at a fascinating painting by the Scottish artist William Walls. Now William Walls was a kind of classic animal painter. Amongst the many exotic animals that Walls painted were polar bears and I'm interested in a particular painting that's here in the collection at Perth. So I'm going to be talking to the curator Amy Fairley to learn a little bit more about this painting. So Amy, we're standing in front of Walls's painting and it's called The Bear's Courtship Greenland. But am I right in thinking there's something slightly misleading about this title? You are indeed right. Um, William Walls was an artist that, as far as we know, never actually visited Greenland. He observed these polar bears in a zoo in Amsterdam and then created this painting from his observations of them in captivity. So he spent his career painting non-Western animals, but actually he's very much a European artist painting animals in zoos. That's exactly it. Also, he was very friendly with um, TH. Gillespie, who went on to found Edinburgh Zoo in 1913 and created a number of illustrations for a book that Gillespie wrote. So in fact I have that book with me <laughs> right here, yes. So this is T.H. Gillespie's book Zoo Tales with illustrations by William Walls and Polar Bear right there on the front Oops. page. I suppose linked to what we were just saying, you could read this painting as him kind of faking it in a way, but actually what I think is it leads us into thinking about the history of zoos and thinking about the accessibility of polar bears in Europe in the late 19th century, early 20th century, they're physically in places such as Scotland. Yeah. And I think, you know, long before these polar bears became, you know, synonymous with climate change, very little was known about them and, and what they looked like. And there's a sort of shift in polar bear imagery, isn't there? Because paintings by sort of Landseer and Riviera show the polar bear being either super ferocious or a really lonely figure in a kind of vast landscape. What I get from walls is something a little bit different. It's almost a little bit of a kind of domesticated polar bear. It's sort of zooming in a little bit and thinking about how they actually behave. That's exactly it. A lot of the artists that were initially documenting and painting these, these bears, they were looking at the ferociousness, you know, that kind of angry... High exotic, drama. Yes, high yeah. drama bear. <laughs> and the vastness of the environments yeah. in which they inhabited. Whereas Walls was looking at them in a different way, he was actually really interested and it seems that he was fascinated by the way in which they behaved towards one another and, and interacted. So William Walls didn't travel to the Arctic to see polar bears, instead the bears were brought to him. Zoos paid especially good money for animals that were hard to capture, like polar bears. He may also have been able to access dead animals in collections of skins and even skulls.
I asked Mark Simmons, the Senior Officer of Collections, to show and tell me more. So we're looking at three skulls of polar bears. There's also some claws. Um, they're part of the museum collections here in Perth and they were brought here to Perth in the 1890s. And how did they get to Scotland? How did they get into this collection? So they were collected as scientific specimens, but to understand uh, why we have polar bears from Greenland in Scotland, you have to understand about the whaling industry and its importance in Scotland at the time. Uh, there had been a number of ports along the east coast where whaling ships would have been heading into Greenland and Canada. Their primary target were indeed the whales and the seals for oil and blubber, but they were interested in killing and bringing back specimens, both for science but also as curiosities. And we have two adult skulls here, but we also have a cub, and am I right in thinking that cubs were often taken kind of captive to the zoos? Uh, yes, the cubs would have been easier to manage, so they would have brought back the cubs live on board the ship um, and sold them on to zoos. And when you look at these, obviously you're looking at them as scientific specimens, but do you ever think about the, the individual animal? Uh, yeah, I think, I think there's a, there is a sad bit of history here, as well as, a, 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 you know, it's, it's part of our economic history. We did need um, whale oil at the time. Um, but, but yeah, you can't help thinking about these magnificent animals in their natural environment, and there we are going along with our guns and destroying uh, this magnificent species. So far in my journey, I've been looking at objects collected or made by Scottish people, whose knowledge about polar bears and the natural environment was naturally limited. It was about time, therefore, that I looked at a representation of a bear produced by people who lived alongside these amazing animals in the wild. So Scottish whalers and explorers brought back live and dead animals from the Arctic, but they also bought, or in some cases simply took, objects for the people who lived there. And these entered museum collections like the one here in Perth. So this is a representation of a polar bear made by an Inuit sculptor in the 19th century and it's been carved from the tusk of a walrus. Our Western kind of cliches of the Arctic often represent it as an uninhabited space, a kind of vast, sublime wilderness. And this completely overlooks the, the deep relationship between local people and the animals there. And I think these objects bring that relationship alive. This is a really unique piece with a such a strong sense of character. The respect that Inuit had for polar bears didn't discourage them for hunting them, because of course polar bears had great practical use. They were important sources of meat, fat and fur. So what we have here are some children's slippers from Newfoundland, which are trimmed with polar bear fur, which was known for its warmth and durability. And of course, polar bears are made to live in this tough Arctic environment, so it makes sense that their fur would be very useful for objects such as these. For the final stop in my investigation, I headed to the Royal Scottish Geographical Society, just across from the Perth Museum, to take a look at the archives of a Scottish artist and explorer, William Byrne Murdoch, who visited the Arctic in the 1900s. During Murdoch's visit, he killed and captured many polar bears. However, he also drew and painted multiple pictures of them in their natural habitat. Before I delve into all that, however, I've enlisted the expertise of the award-winning filmmaker Doug Allen, who has spent years studying and filming polar bears, often alongside figures such as Sir David Attenborough. So as an art historian, I'm always looking at representations of animals, often seen by people who hadn't seen the animals in the wild, but I wanted to talk to somebody Scottish who'd been to the Arctic and has that expertise themselves of seeing animals in the wild. Well, you've come to the right man. <laughs> I've been wildlife filming in the Arctic since 1988, and it's been my privilege to go up there almost every year um, since then and to film uh, the big animals, the polar bears, etc., and also to have a lot of experience of the indigenous people who, who live up there, the Inuit. 
And the results of you being in the Arctic, these television documentaries that you've worked on, mm. this is the way that people like me actually get to experience the Arctic. Mm. But an interest in the Arctic is probably growing these days because mm. of climate change. Is there some aspect of the Arctic though that you think people don't understand having not been there that you'd like people to know more about? A lot of people don't put together just how intimately the ice and the polar bears' lives are connected together. And we know that if climate change carries on, then the polar bear, which at the moment there's about 25,000 polar bears around the whole Arctic, those numbers will come down and there will be parts of the Arctic which are just, there's not enough ice in them for enough of the year for a polar bear to make a living. So what have we got here? So we're looking at the archives of William Burn Murdoch. We've got some lantern slides here. We mm -hmm. have a book he published here, and then right. we have unpublished manuscript there on the right. Burn Murdoch is he's a really interesting character to me because he's partly an explorer, he's partly an artist, and he leaves this great textual record of what he does. I love these these um, old negatives. I'm just struck by how, even though some of them are humorous, the bears are. The bears are very lifelike. The proportions are right. There is this magical connection between a hunter or an artist and the animal that they want to capture. Because in a way, the artist has to capture the animal in his or her painting, just the same way as you would capture an animal by hunting it, in a way. So you definitely need to have that feel. Well, I see this book. It's called Modern Whaling and Bear Hunting. Yes, so, exactly. So you know, he's on a whaling expedition, right. and the main purpose of that is obviously to capture whales. However, they find when they get to this area, they're just um, to the mm. east of Greenland, that there aren't as many whales as they expected. Mm. So their thoughts turn to bear hunting. He actually says that as a child, he dreamt of going to the Arctic and bringing back bear skins. Uh -huh. So he's interested in polar bears as a resource. Mm. And in fact, they captured in this expedition a, a polar bear called, who they call Starboard, who goes on to be the first polar bear in Edinburgh Zoo. Oh, I see. Yeah, I love this bear because, um, you know, you couldn't make a bear as realistic on the canvas if you hadn't seen it for real. And he actually writes at one point, he says, it's a wonder that animal painters, some of them quite distinguished, do not, as a rule, take the trouble to go and study their animals in their proper surroundings. I mean, that sounds to me like it's a dig at walls who didn't go into the wild. Almost certainly Walls and Murdoch know each other. They, I think, worked together in their early yeah. career. So I think we can certainly read that as a kind of yeah. jibe against a fellow artist. <laughs> So Doug, one final thing I'd like to show you, a rather sad but timely quotation in this book yeah. here. Mm -hmm. This is an unpublished manuscript that he writes in the mm -hmm. 1920s. So here, Bern Murdoch writes, I used to think that bears would be the last mammals in the world to be exterminated, owing to the inaccessibility of their ice-guarded habitat. Now I have my doubts. Then he talks about aircrafts coming, submarines, increased tourism. Poor beggars, the museum is the place where the next generation will have to go to study them. Well, I've been filming them for 35, getting on 40 years, and certainly I can tell you the threats facing polar bears now are much greater than what I imagined they would be when I first began to film them. My time spent with Doug highlighted in a personal way that it's more important now than ever to talk about polar bears in relation to the climate crisis and to think critically about their representation. Collections like the ones I've been looking at in Perth are absolutely central to this conversation. However, connections need to be made across collections. To understand this topic, we need to bring together art, ecology, the natural sciences and geography. To understand what polar bears mean to us now and to help protect their future, we need to understand what they meant to people in the past.